about the importance of like living with different teachers. And I'm curious um, if you would speak to, you've lived in many different monasteries, both in Thailand and in, in the West. And I'm curious if you could talk about, um, on the one hand, you know, similarities and differences between living in monasteries in Thailand versus Europe, and also even within Europe, what are the uh, advantages of actually trying out a monastic life in different settings and seeing, um, yeah, how things exist in multiple settings versus um, just a single monastery? I mean, the Christian ideal, Christian monastic ideal of uh, solid, uh, stability, basically you stay at one monastery for your whole monastic life. Um, what are the advantages of not doing that, of, of seeing variety? Yes, that's a that's an important kind of aspect because um, um, yeah, I noticed here in the West there's a fairly limited um, limited number of training environments, places where one can uh, start one's monastic life. Um, say in America, it used to be just just one place, you know, long waiting list, and uh, there's more, but it's um, Certainly, compared to Thailand or any Buddhist country where there's just so much that you can choose from, and you would naturally just have a lot more contact with other monks, you know, visiting other monasteries. But here in the West, sometimes it can feel really quite isolated, quite yeah, cut off from the the rest of the the, kind of the monastic world. Um, we are often just living with really a small group of people. Um, so it's, um, I mean, it's become even recommended practice in, in our monasteries in the West to, to give people that chance to explore other monastic settings, you know, before they, before they say, take the big coordination and then later sending people away for like a, a third or fourth year to go to another monastery or go to Thailand. That's really useful. And, um, because, uh, I mean, it's it's normal that various uh, ajans and teachers will have a particular emphasis, and this is something you see right in the early sutta text, like how the different disciples of the Buddha would uh, have different characteristics, different um, strengths, and um, say Sariputta and Moggallana, they would sort of train the disciples in different in different ways, and then. And would start maybe learning with one and then carry on with another. Um, so we have that disi uh, disciple and mentor relationship in the mentioned in the Vinaya. So it's important that living uh, living uh, teacher disciple uh, contact and relationship is is important. One can learn things that one wouldn't be able to learn just from a book. But and then but having enough choice and variety is another aspect which can be a bit limited uh, especially in our culture in the west just it's just the practicality of it there's just not so many places not so many maybe teachers to go, go around but for myself i found it very insightful uh, i i've spent uh, I, I try to count but i think in the first 20 20 years uh, of um, living as a bhikkhu i I've lived in uh, more than 10 monastic settings for a, a good amount of time, like at least three months at a time. So I've, I was able to experience uh, a good number of different settings and learn yeah, different things from different teachers and just observing the way the places are run, uh, what is emphasized here, emphasized there. And um, I would recommend that to, to others too, because uh, again, one can... Um, say learn one particular uh, way to live as a monk in one monastery and then just make the assumptions you know, or oh, this is this is the way the, it's done correctly or this is the way the only way that in this tradition one is supposed to practice when in fact for someone else other things were um, more important and more useful Tanjan, that's yeah quite useful i think for people to hear about um the usefulness in seeing variety of practice. Um, I'm curious if you could also speak to kind of the 
the balancing aspect of that, of this Nisaya period. So actually there is a period which the Buddha encouraged for young monks to, to stay in one place, you know, for, for five years, stay with your teacher for your first five years. And that does exist in, in Theravada Buddhism in the, the earliest traditions and, and is still practiced in, our, in the Ajahn Chah um, tradition. And I'm curious if you could speak to that because oftentimes if you're a young romantic Westerner, you read the suttas like the Rhinoceros Sutta about wander alone like a rhinoceros. You know, if you don't find somebody who's equal or better, then just stay alone and practice alone and you should continually be camping and living Tudong or Dutanga, you know, taking on these harsh practices. And then someone who comes from that mind state comes to one of these stable monasteries and they see all the faults like, oh, look at these luxurious monks. They've got all these advantages where the true practice is living out in the forest and and they don't realize that they're just following their own their own biases and are, don't realize how their aversion is kind of cropping up and um, yeah, skewing their view on life. And, um, and you having lived in these international monasteries where you're living with people from different countries where this possibility for misunderstanding is even more pronounced. Um, maybe if you could talk to uh, one, this aspect of, of stability as it exists and the usefulness of that, but also of um, kind of working through how do you um, nurture a sense of shared understanding and cohesion in a difficult um, environment where people are coming from different cultures with different ideals and different ideas and the value of that. It's so, it would be so easy for someone who doesn't like one of these monasteries. You go to a monastery, and this you know, has implications for non-monastics as well. You go to a new working environment or a new friend group and you start seeing all the faults and you're like, oh, you know, I see the faults, so I should just run away and find a better environment. But what are the advantages of, of staying in one place and then when you're there, um, creating cohesion? Yeah, there is even that one sutta where the Buddha talks about like the, the advantages and disadvantages of either you know staying too long in one place or just wandering without stop. And one of the things that happen, he says, is uh, if you just keep wandering from place to place, you never develop kind of strong friendships with people or relationships that last. So that would be one one thing, you know, by being kind of kind of forced to be living in the same place with a group a small group of people you really get to know them well and then often based on that you know maybe initially you didn't get along with them but later like a year or two later you actually learn how to get along with this person you, you have to develop a lot of just like acceptance that people are different and equanimity uh you can't just uh, follow your likes and dislikes that much. You have to put up with just uh, the difference differences in people's behavior. And, but based on that, that creates that sense of cohesion. Uh, and I think that is the strength of the Ajahn Chah monasteries in particular, that because people, uh, the, the, the monastics were kind of forced to, to live together for, for years sometimes, either in the early days in Thailand and then in the West, and work together, they form these kind of relationships that that last a, a lifetime, and it can it creates a, a homogeneous group. I mean, there are differences within the group, the individual points of view, but it's cohesive enough to actually function as a group, and that's uh, what creates that same sense of a, a sangha that can actually work together as a sangha. That means, among other things, to perform sangha kamma which means you know the the formal acts of the sangha such as you know performing um, ordinations and dealing with various um, you know sangha business together uh, as a group and you don't see that in any other group really you know uh, there's individual you know monks and nuns here and there in the west kind of doing their individual things but it really seems to be only only those that are that are cohesive enough to form this uh, this particular group um, that come together for things like you know sangha kama and have some regular meetings. The Buddha did encourage the, the monks to come together and um, make um, sort of group decisions on 
on Sangha business together uh, to listen to experienced uh, monks and uh, you know so these these relationships naturally develop within that group and the cohesiveness uh, arises within that group although there is that initial resistance to it you know and I I, I had it too I experienced um, you know this sort of resistance to having to live with people that maybe didn't have the same approach as me I came into the Sangha with um, yeah quite a strong background already in like knowing about the Buddhist teachings Pali and all that whereas most of my peers that were there at the same time uh, had very different approach you know maybe didn't really know that much about Buddhism in particular they were there more for the just looking for a spiritual community a place to you know do some meditation maybe but <laughs> but and, and it was interesting then to see how how uh, the individuals uh, uh, developed over time some of them maybe developed a deeper interest in in, in buddhism later on and, and stayed but many of them kind of dropped off and and were looking elsewhere after some time but uh yeah this this relationship i think we can't really um uh, you can't really do without it, you know, and that uh, the Nisaya relationship is something that is uh, necessary. Yeah. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, I'm curious, you know, just, you know, this Nisaya relationship has been practiced, you know, certainly Ajahn Chah practiced it, the Buddha uh, practiced it, encouraged it, um, and then it has been, um, you know, brought over by Lumpur Sumedho and uh, other teachers in, in this tradition. Um, thinking about the Ajahn Chah lineage as a whole, you know, we had these uh, Western monks from North America and Europe and elsewhere in Asia coming to Thailand. In the first generation of these monks, say like in the late 60s or early 70s, it was a very self-selecting and almost like commando or literally commando group of, of young men um, who were quite strong, you know, and um, because you had to be very strong to be able to uh, endure um, yeah, life in a, a forest monastery like Wat Nong Papuang or Wat Nana Chat in the early days. Um, and now there are, you know, a dozen or so monasteries in the Ajahn Chah, around, Ajahn Chah lineage around the world and other um, kind of Western uh, sanghas kind of cropping up. And I'm curious if, if you could talk to this uh, generational shift in the in the sangha and uh, say where do we go from here? What what's the state of this um, Western sangha? This this generational shift. You know we're now uh, forty five or more years from the establishment of the international monastery in Thailand. Uh, you know over forty years of uh, mo the monasteries in England, uh, over twenty twenty five years of monasteries in North America. Um, so what what are the challenges? What's the state? of this Western Sangha and, and a broader Western Sangha and um, what are the challenges and where do we go from here? Yeah, this is one question that uh, I asked myself um, when we were studying, say, the Vinaya texts. Um, you know, we tend to just approach them as some kind of a timeless document, but uh, you know, they, uh, there was a lot of history, a lot, a lot happened even since the, the time of the early, early Sangha and the time of the Buddha in India. And then there was a lot of development actually uh, through Buddhist history. And that continues until, until now, until today. So in a way we have to take into account, you know, where are we in this, in this process? And we, we are just really coming to the end of like the first generation of the, the 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 pioneers of this Western monastic lineage, uh, say uh, Ajahn Sumedho, he would will soon have been a monk, you know, nearly sixty years. So he is the oldest one in this particular group. And then uh, the like the first generation uh, disciples, the sort of the abbots of the branch monasteries, they are mostly like in their seventies. Or maybe late 60s, 70s, so coming on to 80. Uh, so there's definitely going to be some you know, effect uh, that on the on the whole feeling. So like when the Western monks came, 
in the late 70s to England in the 80s. The, the atmosphere in the monasteries would have been really uh, probably quite different from what it is like today. Um, it was a uh, yeah, pioneering kind of spirit. I think there was a lot of that you know, volunteering um, aspect as well. Lots of lay people uh, just spontaneously coming to help, uh, being willing to offer their time and resources to just start some very basic um, you know, set up in these monasteries and um, like nobody really knew uh, much you know how to do things nobody was like a professional at it uh, it was a lot of just experimentation but people say when they talk about those days that it was a very uh, very inspiring uh, time uh, very um, yeah it was like just a lot of good good feeling uh, in the air and it was just yeah the spirit of of pioneering something, starting something new. And that's the very nice thing about, about that. You know, when you, when you start a new tradition and you, you transplant something onto new soil, then it generates that kind of a lot of goodwill and wanting to help and engage. Um, but then when it's been around for say, decades, maybe four or five decades, of course, there'll be some changes happening. And, uh, and I remember reading um, some of these uh, sociologists of religion uh, have written very interesting texts and, uh, and books about, about Buddhism also. They focused on, uh, they described how Buddhist traditions tend to develop and undergo transformation, say, in the Theravada countries of Southeast Asia. You know, there, there is plenty of recorded history. So um, they pointed out that usually when... Uh, say after some period of maybe the degen degeneration of the sasana, maybe things not going so well, there would be like a split of group, a uh, split of group of uh, uh, monks going to practice in the forest and uh, kind of uh, going back to the original principles that uh, the Buddha established and going to live strictly and maybe quite uh, in an ascetic way and keep all the uh, Vinaya rules strictly again. And then that group, will set up some more permanent places after a while and the teacher might become quite well known and then gradually it will start to attract more and more um, material support from lay people and from the the maybe the rulers of the country until there will be a kind of peak or culmination point uh, at that point say that the main monastery will become really well established and they will start to build like an maybe a, a big meditation hall and uh, or a stupa or something like that, like a monument. And then the teacher will have quite a few disciples and then maybe these disciples will go and set up their own uh, branch monasteries here and there. The tradition will start to spread. Um, and then the original teacher teacher will, will die and the his monastery at that point will often become uh, maybe quite big and uh, with a lot of residents and it will not be as strict as it was originally. Uh, life will generally become, you know, more comfortable. There'll be a lot of uh, requisites and support from the laity. It will become the focus of a lot of faith and, you know, devotion of the laity. So the actual strictness of the practice in that original monastery will decline and might turn into a bit of a museum, but still on a place of inspiration. Whereas uh, the, the other uh, younger uh, disciples of the teacher will develop their places and the cycle will repeat itself usually. So that, that's how it was observed, you know, in uh, various waves of this, um, let's say the forest tradition in, in Southeast Asia. There have been these cycles that, that the tradition has gone through and gradually there was all uh, generally, there was a, uh, a possibility of a re revival every now and then. So for us in the West, maybe it will follow a similar pattern, you know, and then uh, after the, um, you know, the first generation uh, will come to the end of their life, then the, the bigger monasteries might, might become exactly like that, more kind of comfortable and well endowed and, and um, 
uh, good places for the for the laity to to go to. But as long as there is the the opportunity for the uh, um, disciples to establish again other offshoots and, and branches here and there and develop their um, say their teaching skills and and also being able to experiment and, and adapt uh, you know this this way of life of the of the forest monk as long as that kind of possibility is there then the the lineage will not lose its uh, freshness and its appeal so it's important that we have that that opportunity for for the new generation not to just become the sort of the uh, museum uh, caretakers <laughs> so to say but to be able to experiment and go you know through these sort of initial hardships and the pioneering um, uh, time themselves you know otherwise yeah it could become a little bit stale after a while and, and um, lack that uh, possibility of, of renewal mm. yeah thank you Tanjan and yeah, you read about that. I mean, even in the suttas, this kind of the Buddha talking about these periods of degeneration and then uh, revitalization, and certainly yeah, the social um, sociology. You know, people studying this in in the Buddhist contexts, and it reminds me of this uh, Ajahn Man quote, which or and maybe Lumpur Sao as well. But you know that in the future, they're saying that forest monks will start living like city monks. And city monks will start living like lay people, and lay people will start living like animals. And he didn't say this, but I mean, yeah, I mean, these days animals are living like devas. I mean, you got some pretty high class dogs and cats these days. But and and as a junior monk, I remember you know living at certain monasteries, which you know did have a really you know fancy meditation hall and or you know whatever I perceived as a young monk, you know, seeing this meditation hall and really seeing oh, this is the Dharma ending age, you know, the monks, they eat cheese and, you know, they're flying across the world and, and doing these kind of things, or they've got a computer. And, uh, and then saying something to that effect, um, you know, to a senior monk and this monk saying back to me, like, actually, no, I feel like this is, you know, the Dhamma flourishing age, you know, we've got these living teachers, we've got um, Ajahn Pasano, Lumpur Samedo, who are, you know, still teaching and, and living this beautiful, uh, way of life and giving this example and we do have these huts you know you don't have to stay around you know if you don't if you think the main temple is too extravagant go back to your hut it's simple and it's in the forest and you've got this opportunity and um yeah i mean something which uh you know the computers make possible is conversations like this like just for people's backgrounds i've never met uh, tanajan gavesico in person um I've known of your name for a long time, and we've had maybe emails or um, uh, video chats on a number of occasions. But yeah, getting to learn from monastics who are liter literally living on the other side of the world. I'll have to go in five minutes because I've got uh, morning meditation, 5 a.m. meditation, but it's you know eight hours later for Tanajan Govesico in, uh, in Portugal. So um, yeah, I guess just making the most of um, the benefits and trying to avoid the the pitfalls of of technology and uh, the changes and really trying to revitalize keep Buddhism revitalized in one's own practice. Tanajan, would you have any um, kind of parting words of um, yeah, just perspectives uh, that come up from this this conversation, or just that you'd like to share with uh, a wider a wider audience? Yes, just like you said, the um, opportunities are there. You know, we have here in the West in particular, you, I mean, you wonder about the future of civilization and the world, there's all these you know, worrying scenarios, but let's hope that, you know, Buddhism can play a, a positive role in this. And when people in times of crisis have nothing to turn to, that they can find something useful in, in the Buddhist tradition, so I have that kind of hope for these say, monasteries in the West, people being able to practice in a, in a Western environment, that they will use them. And even if all kinds of certainties that people have had in their lives are crumbling and people have to give up things, and but still, if they can use the Buddhist teachings and meditation to find something inside that that's not uh, 
subject to the um, this, um, dissolution and breaking up, then uh, that's that's the best we can offer. And I hope people will make use of that. You know, it's a, it's a great, a great gift. Tanjania, thank you so much. And I would love to talk with you more. If, if people um, are interested, there are other uh, talks by Tanajan Gavesico on YouTube. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time, Tanajan. And I'll turn off this, this stream now. So yeah, thank you. My pleasure.